about to start and uh, good morning everyone as you know today is the third day uh, for the five day series that we have training for agents that are joining our office and today our focus is mainly on mortgage and financing and the financing products and options available for buyers uh, but before we go there if you remember our homework was p My supposed package. to prepare a buyer's package this is something prepared by the office already for you mm -hmm. uh, all you have to do is just ch change this picture and come up with a bio of yourself a, a small paragraph is there a template yeah the rest everything is like for example this page you don't need to change anything no, 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 no. These pictures are showing that you're part of this team. Okay. So, for example, I'm, I'm your broker, Nilo is your manager, she's, yeah. and you need all these people to function. So, it shows you, makes you look big, and you will be looking like part of a team. And the seven things that you can do for them, I hope you do it. So, things like, some of the things we do at the office like MLS and KGG and things like that, some other things you go through it, I'm sure that you can do it for them. So these are the seven promises that you will make for them that you will do. And this is more frequently asked questions that they might have about the buying process. So this should be, this is not the whole package, but this is part of your package. I think the least it could be is this and then your buyer agency agreement and the questionnaire inserted inside this when you go to the appointment. So that's the least that you could do. Yeah, so this buyer's package, if you have not done it, we have done it for you. So I think it's nicely designed and uh, if you print this, it will co cost you a couple of dollars. I mean, if you print at least 50, if you print a lot more than that, it will be even less than that. But yeah, but for now, maybe 50 should be good enough. Uh, I think you need this to impress, uh, especially in your first uh, meeting with the client. Mm -hmm. And with, it will also give them information that, uh, especially if they're first time buyer, they will know what's the whole process of buying. So I'm assuming there's also a sales package like that? Yeah, yeah, but the content is different. So we'll discuss that tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Any questions from yesterday or day before or anything? You talk to Nilo. We already have the template. Yeah, the template. Oh, okay. So you just send your just send yeah, just send your picture and your bio, we will change it for you. And then send a PDF file. We cannot change anything else yeah, yeah. because that will be too much time consuming. Mm -hmm. The only thing we can change is a picture here and a bio here because the rest everything else is generic. Mm -hmm. it, it applies to everyone. Yeah. Any agent. So you send this and we will, we will send the PDF version, then you can send it to your own printer and company, wherever you want to print. Uh, we have printed 50 for about $500, so that's a $2, yeah. So it will be in that range, $2. It's worth it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry? Not too bad. Yeah, yeah. Especially the, the cost of designing is more yeah, expensive yeah. than the cost of printing. That's true. Yeah, okay. You've done major of the work already. Yeah, yeah. Okay. but it will help. It will help. So any questions from the previous sessions, like uh, about buying or about planning, that those are the two sessions that we have discussed so far? No questions? OK. Uh, OK, so today is about financing. But I think before I go and move forward, there are a couple of quotes that I want to bring your attention to. We all know who is this guy, Winston Churchill. And he says, success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. And it is so true. Uh, don't expect that everything will be rosy and uh, everything will be nice and everybody will be nice with you and everything will flow. No, I mean part of any job, any business, doing anything, you will come across uh, things that may not necessarily be smooth. I think you have to learn from those failures and be successful. The people that lose, and this applies more to self-employed, which means a business person, which you and I and everyone in this room is, uh, we, after a couple of failures, we lose uh, energy. And, and once that happens, then we gave up. And, and the time that you're almost going to make it, you gave up. That's generally the case. The time that you have learned from your mistakes 
and you know how to play the game, that, but you have run so much that you're tired now, that you cannot do anymore, you lose energy, and then you don't continue. I think that is a very important point about this code, and I think uh, I want you guys uh, to face the reality that that might be the case. This is another code, I think, uh, I thought it might be nice to uh, maybe have a... <laughs> it's not whether you get knocked down, it is whether you get back up again. So, I think it's not a matter of uh, people not rejecting you, never. I think it, things uh, will happen, as I discussed earlier. I think you have to be committed. Uh, uh, you have to, you have to be believing in what you are doing, and more importantly, you have to have some motivation. I have seen agents and salespeople that have some motivation, whether it is family, whether it is the house that they want to buy, or the car that they want to buy, or the wife that they want to impress, or a future wife beautiful that they want to attract, whatever the case might be, if you're motivated, you always have a reason to wake up in the morning and do what you're supposed to do. I'm going to repeat what I have probably said quite a few times in the past couple of days, and that is everything that's discussed here, if you implement it, it will work. Uh, if you just have knowledge about it, having a knowledge is not good enough. I think the best use of knowledge is that what it works. So you have to take action. And by action, I mean only a couple of hours a day. You just do the things that are discussed here. Everything that we are discussing in these five days, if you just dedicate two hours a day for five days of the week, you can do everything that we discuss here. If you work just for two hours, including those brochures initially and those bios, just make your work hours six to eight. Those are the hours that I think are more productive than any other time. Not for you, but what I'm saying is when you call people that are at home and available. That's what I mean. So if you just have those couple of hours, things will work, I, I mean, from my experience. Uh, but if you just uh, let it go and be everywhere, then you will not find time to do the things that are necessary, and that is prospecting. Prospecting is the bloodline of this business. Prospecting means c picking up the phone and calling uh, people that you have kept in touch with or followed up with or whatever the reason might be. Uh, I think if you don't do that and if you're just expecting that you advertise and people start calling you, you might get clients but they may not necessarily be qualified clients as you have a good experience. So. Uh, somehow you have to treat this like a business and be on top of it. Okay, so about financing, uh, I think this is the first video. We might play a lot of videos today because financing is not my area of specialty. I'm not a mortgage broker. So I will share some of the interviews that I had with some of the mortgage brokers and they share their experiences, but at the same time we will also add on it so we can learn together. This is the first series of those videos that talks about uh, whether you should buy or rent. Now this video is prepared for the potential uh, buyer, the people that are currently renting and convincing them why buying is good. But I think this will give you a base that you can use the same argument if you're targeting a first time home buyer, people that are renting. And you can even forward this video if you think it works. Or you can prepare a video. These days preparing a video is so easy. You just sit in front of your laptop and uh, upload it on YouTube so the world could watch. And I think this uh, will give you some basic knowledge of why renting is better than uh, Let's see if you have, if you can come up with some of your own ideas that you can add to this. Hello and welcome to Real Estate in Focus. Uh, today we are going to discuss about an important issue that buyers face. Whether should I buy or keep on renting? Before I answer that question, you have to find out if you are approved, whether your financing is approved to allow you but let's assume that you're approved to buy a home. Of course, we buy a home for 
Okay, so as you can see, I'm not trying to convince and say that you can buy a house and it will be the same payment as rent, which most agents do. That's not the case. I don't think that's real. Uh, even if interest rates are as low as it is now, it's still when you add the property taxes, when you add the utilities, when you add the maintenance costs, it will come much higher than your rent. So. Uh, when people make statements that rent is equal to buying in terms of monthly payment, I don't think that is an accurate statement. So I think, as you can see in this video, my convincing argument is that it will force you to save. Even though you will pay more money today, but at least the house will be worth 300000 in future. Now, some people might argue that things in the United States crashed and it may crash and it will be worth less than 300,000. Yes, I'm not saying that may not happen, although there is a lot of reasons that kind of a crash may not happen in Canada, but let's assume it, if it will happen. Because you're living in that house, uh, you don't have to sell when the crash happens. You will sell it when the market is up. So let's say there is a, quite a lot of people right now in the US actually, this is a problem that they want to retire and sell their house, but because the market has gone down, they have not sold their houses. So because you're living in that house, you could wait till the market gets back to normal uh, values, and then you can sell it at that time. So it is a forced saving. If you rent till end of your uh, years that you live, like 60, 70 years, you will end up with nothing. But with buying, at least you have some equity in the house. Right? It could range from the price that you bought today or higher or lower, but you will have something that you can count on. This is the calculation. I think this calculation is very easy. So if you pay $1,000 a month uh, in tr 25 years, you will pay that much. You will pay more, of course, when you, when you buy, but you will have at least, hopefully, the equity, the 300000 so it's not about that uh, rent is equal to uh, buying in terms of monthly payment because there is a lot more expenses here. It's not only the mortgage because of low interest rates, but it is property taxes, insurance, utilities, and sometimes repairs and maintenance, which makes it more obviously expensive. So that argument that these days the interest rates are low, uh, I don't think it's a valid argument, even in today's interest rates. It's about lifestyle. Do you want to spend more um, money on your housing today, or do you want to have more vacations when you're young and enjoy life and then handle your situation when you're older? It's just about lifestyle issues. And a lot of people actually 
if you one of the uh, advertising or marketing uh, ideas that is convincing is that some agents argue which is kind of valid that you buy a house to secure the future of your children and a lot of parents sacrifice by you know not doing a lot of things that they uh, want to do and they buy a house and then they have bigger mortgage payments and then you can convince them that you can buy for this reason to secure for your children or for your retirement okay so the benefits of real estate these are all again related to financing leverage is uh, something that makes real estate uh, a very unique product if you buy any other investment for example if you buy stock markets or GICs or mutual funds you have to give in most cases a hundred percent cash so let's say if you invest in uh, Apple stocks in Apple if you buy shares that means you will give hundred percent of those shares cash if it goes up by 20%, let's say if you invested $1,000, it is worth $1,200. But if you bought a house and invested the same amount, even if it goes 5% up, not 20% up, your investment was only 20%, so that's why your return on your investment is much higher, even though the increase or appreciation was lower. Because yeah, that's how the power of leverage works in real estate, which is not available in most other investment products. So leverage is one of the unique, and I think this is an example that illustrates what I said. So if you buy this, the house for cash, if it increases 5% a year, at the end of the day, your return will be 15% after five years, which is 45,000. But if the same house was bought with leverage, which means you came down with 20%, well, some people come down with 5 or 10 or 15, but let's say 20%, in five years, same increase, but your return is much higher because you earned 45,000 on your down payment. You don't care about this price. If this was a stock or GIC or something else, then you will pay 100% cash. So that's the difference of leveraging in terms of real estate. So that's one argument. The second argument is that your, your principal payment will be paid off. So for example, in the same scenario with 20% down, if interest rates are 5% and your amortization is 25 year, you will pay about 30,000 of that amount. So almost half of your money will come back because you're paying down the principal mortgage. Right? Any questions so far? Of course, if you buy it in a right market, uh, Toronto, for example, have been appreciating on average six, seven, eight percent, and some places like Vancouver, uh, as I showed uh, on the other meeting, has gone up in double digits every year appreciating. Uh, appreciation is something I will consider as a bonus. Unfortunately, a lot of people, for example, that buy condos in downtown Toronto, they only count on appreciation and nothing else. They think that they will buy at 400 today and next year it will be 500 and they will make 100,000. This is a bonus. You cannot always count on this. This depends on economy, real estate cycle, and so many other factors. Interest rates, job market, uh, and supply and demand. So I think generally a good solid a uh, real estate investor will count this as a bonus, not, not as a real uh, thing that will for sure happen. It's not guaranteed. But I think uh, if you buy uh, this uh, house in a good market, I think for me, a good market or a good uh, neighborhood or a go good town is a place that is growing. The population is growing. So for example, uh, Stouffville, where Josh, you live, uh, it had a population increase of 54% uh, in the past five years. That's a very high increase. Average Canadian growth was in the past five years, which is between 2006 and 2011, 5.9%. Uh, so let's say almost 6%. 
average Canadian growth, population growth was 6%, but your town, Stouffville, was 54%. That's almost 10 times more. So obviously, even if the market goes down, if you're in a town like Stouffville, and there is an increase in population 54%, population means more bodies, and those bodies need somewhere to be saved mm -hmm. <laughs> inside the shelter. So uh, it, there will be a demand for rental for housing. So if you buy it at the right place and other factors, like for example, a transportation coming to the town, one of the things that helped is go, go train is going to Stouffville. Yeah. So that helped uh, growing the city too. And then another thing that helped was because, we will discuss this on uh, Friday, but another thing because it is just the next city after Markham, and whenever a city grows, then the city surrounding it will also grow, like Stouffville. It's just people are now moving from Markham to Stouffville, mm -hmm. right? So if you buy, if it appreciates by 5% a year on average, you have 45,000 increased, which is representing 15%. And if you have a principal payment and you, you had a profit of 75,000, you know, I'm not counting, previously we were, we were uh, in the first slide uh, also discussing about other issues but if you just consider these two factors if it appreciates you will have a very high return at the end of the day what we are trying to say is that because of leverage because of principal payment and this bonus of appreciation that's why most people consider to buy and you should be aware of these three terms appreciation principal payment and leverage Okay, this is something else that is very interesting that uh, everything else you buy, you have to pay tax. Even there is this uh, misconception that some people have that you will not pay taxes on your RRSP. Yes, you will not pay today, but whenever you take it out and withdraw it, you have to pay. It is just that when you withdraw it and if you're a uh, at your retirement age, if you don't have much of an income, you may not pay uh, a lot of uh, taxes because you, you will be taxed based on income and that RRSP will be used as an income. Uh, but no matter what you have, you will pay taxes. This is the only thing that I'm aware of that you will not pay tax. Right? Because it's principal residence. Of course, I have written here capital gain tax because if you buy property for investment purposes, then you will be paying taxes. But even that taxes is better than normal business income tax because on business in income tax, you will pay 100% of the income. Uh, but uh, in capital gain tax, you will pay half of it. But in case of principal residence, you will pay no taxes. Okay, so let's uh, kind of summarize what we have discussed so far. The, the I think buying for me, most importantly, it will force you to save money. That is the most attractive point because if you claim that your, your payment, mortgage payment is equal to rent and things like that, I think you will be proven to be wrong. That's not a good argument. Or if you claim that prices will increase every year if you buy today and next year it will be worth more, that's also not a valid argument because it's not guaranteed that it will increase. Forced saving is a long-term vision. That means you buy today and you will pay more money out of your pocket today, but down the road 20, 25, 30 years later, you will have some money for your retirement. That's the whole argument. And it's also about lifestyle. And as I said, it is uh, principal payment is paid, appreciation is a bonus, and because of leverage, your return on your investment is much higher. Any questions before we move forward? Okay, so now if you're working with a buyer, uh, uh, credit scores are one of the important factors that will uh, determine whether they're qualified for a mortgage or not. So I have interviewed uh, uh, David McGee in this video. He used to be part of Royal Bank of Canada. I think he has moved to somewhere else now. So uh, he has a, he's a good mortgage broker and he explains the importance of uh, credit scores and how it works. And I think as a real estate agent, you should be having a basic knowledge of this.
Any questions? At the time of interviewing him, I think these products, mortgage products, change. For example, a few years ago, you could buy a house with zero down payment, and he's saying five percent. Although I think most of the things that he said is still valid, but remember, these things change, and you have to be updated. But I think I just want to emphasize on this slide that how your score is uh, kind of uh, divided in terms of how they score you on your uh, credit rating. The past payments represent about 35% of your credit. How you're utilizing your credit is 30%, which means if you're fully using it, if you if your I don't know line of credit or Visa card or whatever it is is 5,000 and you max it out, that means you will lose a score. Uh, a rule of thumb, I think he was saying you should have 25% available. Uh, this is more like where do you have uh, and how you have made your payments and things like that. Uh, how many cards do you have? You know that's inquiries. That's why when your client goes for getting a mortgage, you should not go to so many mortgage brokers. This question came up yesterday too. If we are referring them to three mortgage brokers, doesn't mean that they should sign an application on all three because it will have an impact on their uh, credit. And this is the type of credits that they have. So I think the way they calculate, there might be a difference between a credit card that you're using from CIBC Visa as opposed to, I don't know, Canadian Tire or Sears. So uh, although they're all credit, but there are different type of credit. One is just you can use it at one particular store. The other one, you can use it anywhere. So that's the breakdown of how they utilize your credit. Now, uh, this is the type of mortgages that are available in the market. Uh, I think I will play again. This is another, this is a mortgage broker, uh, independent, not working with any bank. Uh, let's see what she says and then let's see if you guys have any question about the type of mortgages that are available. And I think it's important because it's, it's mortgage, people just think it's just one type of mortgage. There are so many types of different mortgages. Okay, 
So do you guys understand those different terms of closed, uh, variable, and open? Some people confuse open with variable. Those are totally diff two different things. Like they come and say, I want to have an open mortgage. Probably they mean I want to have a variable mortgage, right? Uh, open is the term, whether it is open or closed for a specific term, whereas variable and fixed is different thing, right? Uh, I think there is a lot of other terms in uh, mortgage and types of mortgages, but in that short segment, we cannot cover everything. That's the most common types of mortgages. Okay. I think if you uh, have uh, noticed yesterday, which we were discussing about buyers, uh, I was uh, kind of mentioning that you should prepare a uh, CMA when you're buying so that you can give confidence to your buyer. In this video, uh, I have interviewed an appraiser. You know that most of the time when you apply for a mortgage, uh, the lender will appraise the property. They will find out if the purchase price you have paid is uh, going to be same, the appraiser will come at least at the same or higher. If it comes at higher, they will take the purchase price that you have paid on your, or your, your agreement of purchase and sell. If it comes lower, you will have to pay the difference. So let's say if you bought at uh, 500 and the appraisal comes at 450, you have to give not only the down payment, let's say 5, 10 or 20%, but it, in addition to that, the difference between 450 and 500, which is a lot of money. When market shifts, in this market, this may not be a problem, but when market shifts, this could become a huge problem. So for example, you pay today with a multiple offer situation, more than asking price, the bank comes and says, and you have no conditions. And then the bank comes and says, you know what, what you have paid is not worth it. So come up with difference. And your client will have the shock of his life or her life because they never thought that other than down payment they ha and closing costs, they have to now take care of this difference in price. Uh, people, the deals f f fall through, problems happen, people sue, and especially agents could be in trouble that they say they did not protect my interest. So that's why having that uh, financing condition is important for this specific purpose that you want the lender to know if it is worth it and if they can give the mortgage for that amount, right? If they can appraise it. Uh, so appraisal becomes a crucial issue. And, and I think even if you have financing condition, which is for five days, if you're not working with a professional uh, mortgage uh, agent, Sometimes they delay this appraisal till after five days. They say, oh, everything is okay, you waive it. And you waive the conditions, and then just before closing, you come to know that you know this property did not appraise at the price that it was supposed to, and then everyone is in trouble. So when you're working with a mortgage broker, make sure to tell him or her that please appraise the property within that five days. When you go for CMHC financing, CMHC sometimes may not do the appraisal. They have their own system. I think it's called Maya, that it's computerized. So what they do is they look at the neighborhood and then they come up with your price. But if you go through conventional mortgage, which is, that means your client is giving 20% or more down payment, most probably the banks will go for uh, appraisal. There might be odd banks that may not go for appraisal, but whatever the case might be, I think you should ask this question because your client is not aware of this issue. You should ask the mortgage broker, are you going to do the appraisal within these five days? If it is needed to be done. If it is not needed to be done, of course, no one is going to be worried about it. Mm -hmm. But if it is needed to be done, it, it has to be done within, within those five days. By the way, just uh, something that's out of your control, the bank may come closer to closing time and do another appraisal and may say, you know what, now I cannot give you that much loan because the market has shifted. Uh, market might crash or whatever will happen, but that's not in your control. At least what is in your control, which is ordering the appraisal in the f those conditional period, you should be aware of it and pay a close attention with the mortgage broker. Okay, so how that appraisal works, I think this video is about that. Maybe it will give you a basic knowledge. And again, we are not 
appraisals, right? And never call yourself that I'm coming to appraise your property. We are evaluating their property. These professionals are charging money and they are appraising the property, which they gave a written report. Let me tell you something more about appraisal. Do you guys have any question, by the way? Later. Okay, so I will tell you my point, and yes. then you can ask me the question. Uh, appraisals are also human beings, and, and I think they will get influenced, for example, by your purchase price. So let's say if their evaluation comes at five or 10,000 below the purchase price, they might just say it is at the purchase price. So they will get influenced by the purchase price. Some appraisers are more stricter than others. They are more specific. So it depends. I, I, these appraisers are not selected by you. They are on the list uh, of uh, uh, banks or financial institutions that they will call upon themselves directly and they will send. Generally, they are paid by the lender. If not, it is generally paid by the mortgage broker. So they take care of this. But uh, I, I think the other thing that you should know that generally appraisals come below the market value. So it, I have seen as low as 10%, 20%, 5% below the, what the value of the property is because they want to protect themselves. So things go to court and they are called upon. They have to protect the evaluation that they have put forward to the financial institution. So they will be more conservative than market. 
because in market there is hype, there is emotions, people will buy because the kitchen looks so good. They will pay 50,000 more because of a kitchen that is just a little bit better and the owner has spent maybe 5,000. So they will pay another 40, 45,000 just for nothing. But appraisals will not do that. They are more with numbers and number crunching. So they're more conservative than the market. So you have to be careful when you buy properties and go for financing and you have not a kind of made sure that the appraisals will come on time during the due diligence or during the mortgage financing period. So your question? Well, you answer about 50% of the question. Okay. <laughs> but so, for example, like a bank, when they look at the uh, appraisals done by the appraiser, and what is the, the, the discount factor percentage was that the bank is willing to go up to 20% of the value or 25? No, they will not discount anything. As no, what I mean is like say, you know, the, say the value is 500,000 and the appraiser says what's 475. They will go with 475. So, but then the client has to come up with the difference. Of difference, yes. The banks will, as financial institutions, because remember banks, again, there are human beings sitting on the other side. Right. So uh, uh, let's say a loan officer, for right. lack of words, let's call that person loan officer, will not take the risk of losing his or her job okay. by giving you a five, approving a 500,000 evaluation if the appraisal came for 475. Mm -hmm. These are all linked to each other. He will give loan based on 475, not because he's sitting at his office desk and feeling that it's worth 500, but because the appraisal said so. Right. So his approval or her approval is based on the appraisal. Right. And then the appraiser will appraise it based on his uh, opinion of the value. So everybody wants to protect in this chain that just in case things go wrong, they're all protected. Mm -hmm. So for example, appraisal comes by with 490. Yeah, then your client will have to come the difference. Wow. Yeah, and sometimes clients will be upset because they will say you bought this property more expensive for me. And that may not necessarily be the case. Maybe that is the market value. Right. Yeah. But generally what I have seen is that if it is very close, I mean the appraisal just says it's worth at the purchase price. If it is within a few thousand, but if there is a big difference, they will yes. you have to come up with a difference. Which sometimes it's a big money. Big money. So let's say if your client only has five percent of 500,000, which is 25,000, and they have added another 5,000 for closing costs, so the, their whole budget is about 30,000. If the appraisal comes 25,000 less, like at 475, <laughs> it's like them buying another house. Yeah. Where will they come up with that money? So you have to be very careful about this issue with the mortgage broker, especially when the market shifts, this will become more common problem. By the shift, I mean today it's at one price, at yeah, the yeah. time of closing, it's a different lower price. So that can make the deal fall through. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And people get sued and commissions not paid and agents get in trouble. So just to protect yourself and your commission, uh, although this has less to do with you and more with the mortgage broker, it is mortgage broker's duty to, to make sure that the appraisal is done within before they give the conditional period. I mean, and also other things, just to be a word of ca caution. When the mortgage broker says that it's okay, you can waive the condition, ask your client to ask them to send something in writing that they can waive the condition. Then your client will be more protected, right? Because most, I can tell you from experience, most or some, I don't know whether should I say most or some, but at least there will be mortgage brokers that will not do appraisal during those due diligence period. Next question: Will the will uh, doing an appraisal, a finished based on or unfinished based on, will that have a uh, effect on an appraisal or price of property? It might, but not a big deal. Okay. Yeah, not a big deal. So the reason why I'm saying is because a lot of times you have, you know, especially in the market area, basements are completed, which is not legal status, and uh, and because they have made the basement and it's possible for rental, the price yeah. has gone up. Yeah. But yeah. then when the appraiser looks at the house, does, yeah. the, does the appraiser take this into consideration? The, the consideration probably will be, because the appraisal have access to zoning information. Right. So if this is not a duplex, if it is a duplex, it will add value. That right. means you have an extra unit with income. Right. If it is not a du legal duplex and it's not zoned for multifamily, mm -hmm. then it may not necessarily add much of uh, value. 
but they come and visit the property. So right. it's not just a basement. It is Correct. the quality of the kitchen, everything. They consider the condition of the property and everything in between. Okay. Now, although this video is recorded uh, with the mortgage broker, it's, a more, it more, it's more applicable to a seller. But because today's session is more about general financing, so we are discussing everything uh, between buyer, seller, and everything in between. Uh, basically, this video was prepared for the purpose that if they can, if a buyer or if a seller or if a homeowner cannot afford the mortgage payment, what should they do? What is the other option? And let's see what the mortgage broker suggests and then we go from there. <coughs> that point I, I I hope I, I got the point across uh, very clearly that uh, generally uh, I think what happens is that I think people uh, especially the newcomers to this country they they buy houses and uh, with one person working or t a couple working they cannot afford it so what they do is that they rent the basement so that they have an extra income and I think it's a lot of money in today's uh, mortgage rates your eight nine hundred of income from the basement could cover two hundred thousand of your mortgage so if you bought a property for let's say four hundred thousand half of it is paid by your tenant in the basement so that's why people do this and have basements although it does does not come with uh, no headache there is headaches and there is uh, you know you have to deal with tenants and things like that but well, this video shows, and hopefully it will give you an idea that maybe you, if you want to market yourself, and again, we are discussing so many ideas. It depends on you which one you want to pick. Uh, if, they, if you want to target the first time buyers or renters that they, they just have whatever budget per month, you can tell them, okay, let's buy a house. You might end up paying about the same money, but if you rent the basement. 
but it's a big risk because you have to find properties that are legally zoned. Uh, of course, I can tell you more than 90% of rentals in Toronto, in Markham, is not legal and people do it, but it provides them with the option of income. Uh, again, this is another idea that you can target another type of buyers, which are mainly people that cannot afford or they want to move from a smaller house to a bigger house but they cannot afford the bigger house and the finishing the basement will help. But finishing the basement has its own rules and regulations as uh, the guy, the specialist was pointing out, the zoning is one of them and then there is the fire code, building code and things like that that they have to meet. But these days people just finish the basement without being and following those rules, right? So for example on MLS, there are a lot of times that you see properties that are being sold and it also states in there that you know, uh, based on the problem for potential income. So would that be false advertising in regards to regulation? Or I think that because first of all they use the word potential income. Yeah. Secondly, if it is, you might rent that to your kid and charge them money. Mm -hmm. You might rent that to your in-law and charge them money. So, uh, you know, as, as it is called in-law in -law's suite. basement, suite or basement, yeah. which means uh, it could be somebody related to you, but they are living in the basement. Mm -hmm. So that could be the case. Oh, another thing that I just want to point out about basements is that you, when you're in doing the, in the insurance, you make sure that you tell your clients that they should inform the insurance that they have a tenant. Because I know someone, they had a fire in the basement, did not inform the insurance, the insurance did not cover so you have to be careful. It's exactly 11 o'clock. Do you guys want to take a break and come back? Sure. Yeah? Is it okay that, can you guys promise in 10 minutes to be back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, 10 minutes is good enough? Yeah. My watch is slow. Yeah. I think the topics are interesting, so the time passes fast. Yeah. What's today's date? Yeah. 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 Yeah